Welcome everybody again for this evening talk. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Joanna Krenz. Uh, all who have been involved in the project already know her quite well, and I think that's even all of you, but nevertheless, I want to give uh, a brief introduction. She uh, studied Chinese studies at uh, um, uh, University of Poznan and uh, got also the MA there in uh, Chinese studies. Actually, she got two MAs in Chinese studies and in Polish uh, language and literature, which um, makes her um, the best choice for doing comparative studies like she has been doing lately. Then uh, um, she went also to China, uh, to Yunnan University, uh, not far from Guilin, actually. <laughs> so we have this nice picture and uh, Andrea's background and then eventually moved on to Leiden in the Netherlands, where she got her PhD in Chinese literature. Um, and after that, uh, she has been working in Poznan at the university as uh, currently as assistant professor, I think. Or, um, yeah, she has also been involved in our uh, project in the Center for Advanced Studies, Poetry in Transition, and has been here in Trier where some of us are actually right now uh, for quite a while. And we are very glad that we continue. We are happy to uh, continue this cooperation. Now, today's talk is about uh, children's literature uh, in China. Uh, the title is uh, Swatting Mosquitoes, Contemporary Child Authored Poetry from China. And now, uh, Please go ahead with your talk, the floor and the screen, and uh, the audience is all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and I'm really happy to see you all. And um, yeah, I will start sharing my screen in the meantime. Um, I have a bad news for you, because when I tried to sort of rehearse my lecture uh, today in the morning, it took something like 90 minutes, so I will really do my best to squeeze into something like one hour perhaps plus a few minutes but you know in case at any point you get bored or I don't know have any problems of with understanding my standard Polish accent or whatever so please don't hesitate to interrupt at any any moment um okay so where is the full screen mode Okay, mm. so yeah, let's get started finally. Um, let me begin before I, I get to some more uh, specific information <laughs> by by the poem that you have or you are already quite familiar with from my uh, abstract. Um, the poem um written by Lee Rong, a seven-year-old girl. Writing poetry is like swatting mosquitoes. Sometimes I smash one by accident, sometimes I swat and swat and can't reach it. I think writing poetry is just like this. Uh, this uh, definition of poetry opens the 2017 anthology poetry written by children Heidzem and the Shu, uh, edited by poet Guomai, Guomai uh, which uh, contains works of over 60 authors uh, from three to 13 years of age. And uh, it's also on, on its cover, there's also a very catchy motto, child, you were born a poet, uh, which is sometimes also treated as the subtitle, um, but it's hard to say whether it, is, it really plays this role or not. Anyway, that's probably some marketing trick. Uh, and another point to discuss, of course, whether this statement is true or not. And the anthology isn't the first and isn't the only anthology of this kind in China, but it gathers the best of the best of children's poetic output, uh, which has been intensely circulating on the Chinese internet and in social media for around 20 years. And it has attracted growing attention of mass and specialist audiences um, in China. Uh, the beginnings of this phenomenon of the interest in the Chinese uh, children's writing date back more or less to the early 2000s uh, and to the release of an individual collection of the then I think 11 year old boy Chen Ang, 
titled The End of the World. And it was, of course, followed by uh, other publications and activities of uh, Chan Ang, who, who was then enthusiastically called poetry prince, Shi Ge Wangzi. We'll talk a little bit um, more about him later. Um, since then, the internet has seen the emergence of good dozen of other like princes and princesses of poetry, and some of them were even at the preschool age and technically like not even capable of writing poetry, and their words were just jotted down by their parents who assumed the role of sort of a poetry secretaries as the father of um, the Jiang sisters, Jiang Puyu and the most famous siblings on the Chinese poetry soon uh, put it uh, in one of the interviews. Um, we will get back to the Jiang sisters too. And of course, although um, the phenomenon isn't like specific for China only and the readers across the world are familiar with, the, with the, 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 this phenomenon and um, basically like you can just find on the web, on the, web uh, on the internet, a lot of competitions uh, addressed to poetry contests, addressed to little kids, like even from kindergarten. But still, I don't think any other country can boast such a dynamism of this phenomenon and such a large scope as, as China does, and which may be a little bit surprising for Western readers who basically often like, associate China with the country which hugely limits the creativity of children and suppresses it with the, by the, the education system very much suppresses the creativity and it's mostly focused on memorizing various things and learning the classics and so on and so on. Still, when you just start browsing this anthology, you will see that uh, ch Chinese children are anything but uncreative and they have very rich imagination and also huge self-awareness, both as human beings and as poets, including sort of formal self-awareness. Um, of course, at the same time, we should be um, careful not to like succumb to recklessly to the wave of enthusiasm, which is actively stimulated by publishers and by media, which like skillfully operate with sentiments and stereotypes in their various attempts to recreate and of course monetize one version of the archetypal myth of childhood or, or, or another. And among many interpretation, interpretational frameworks in which the general discussion on childhood poetry and childhood in poetry develops, uh, one can distinguish two particularly salient and abiding models, which I ten tentatively called songs of innocence and songs of genius. And of course, this first term is borrowed from William Blake's famous poem cycle, in which innocence is like conventionally contrasted with experience. And that figure of the child is connected with characteristics such as purity, unconstrained freedom, happy and awareness of evil and so on. And uh, the child is perceived as a sort of an unblemished noble savage who has not yet been affected by, by culture, social etiquette, hierarchies, biases, etc. But of course, interpretations along the lines of the songs of innocence model, uh, which like uncritically glorify children's work, in fact, do no justice to the complexity and diversity of the inner worlds of, of the children. And well, to illustrate the insufficient insufficiency of this approach, let's uh, juxtapose Blake's like archetypal child who sits on a cloud and asks for a sweet song about a lamb with, for example, the poem, A Lamb on Snow, written by Jiang Xinghe, one of the two famous sisters when she was only 11 years old, which like shows how deeply conscious of the cruelty of the world children actually are and how they try to deal with it. And they are, that they are in fact capable of identifying certain psychological mechanisms. In this case, it would be self-defense against like overwhelming grief and, and pity. Uh, in themselves as if like looking at themselves from outside. So let's quickly read the poem. On snow in front of grandma's door, a lamb is always tied. Every day I run to feed and leave. Sometimes it suddenly gets fat, sometimes suddenly gets thin, sometimes suddenly gets tall, sometimes suddenly gets short, sometimes suddenly gets big, sometimes suddenly gets small. In fact, it's not the same lamb. It's just I that I take it for the same lamb. And I refuse to like uh, look at the butchers nearby to alleviate my inner pain. Well, on the other hand, let, let's read Blake along with 
Tietos, uh, a little boy born in 2006, whose poem Wheat was dated to 2015, when he was just nine years old. And he's very straightforward about his desire to eat wheat, which adults treat as a sacred thing instead of showing love for every living thing that you would probably conventionally expect from a child. Uh, so here it is, wheat. On the expressway, wheat and I brush past each other. Grandma has friendly feelings toward wheat, always cherishes the memory of it. I have no feelings toward wheat at all. I haven't even seen it closely. My only friendly feeling is to eat it. Uh, so yeah, uh, incidentally, the motif of wheat in modern Chinese poetry is very closely associated with a specific romantic vision of poethood, which haunts contemporary literature. And it makes way one thing immediately about Heidze, who is known as a wheat poet, and so he's one of the most tragic figures in the history of Chinese uh, new poetry, and he committed suicide at the age of 25, which is, uh, gave rise to one of the most powerful mythogenic uh, narratives in, in Chinese literature. And Tieto, of course, probably being uh, unaware of it, deconstructs this myth in a way that is almost as spectacular as the famous desecrator Isha in his uh, well-known manifesto poem, Star of the Poets, where he like declares uh, blatantly, you poets have eaten your field, vast fields of wheat, filled your bellies with their savor, the city's greatest sponsors then, then turned themselves into glorious farmers of verse wheat. In the name of the sunlight, the rain, I call, I call on you to starve them, starve those fucking poets. You can start with me first, a sidekick polluting this air with ink bastard of the art world. So uh, as we will see a little bit later, Tieto, who, who debuted at six years old, mm, with a collection published by the prestigious Tsinghua University Press has uh, much more in common with Isha than the single poem and like his take on topics such as desire or female sexuality I certainly do not fit into the topos of innocence. And on that note, Isha, uh, who authored that uh, poem on the right side, has been one of the most outspoken advocates of children, of poetry written by children in, uh, among adult poets in China, which is not surprising given his general artistic interest in things that lie closer to the notion of unbridled human nature and uh, than, than civilized human culture. And those unpolished diamonds of which I authored poems are certainly a valuable, valuable finding for him. And he doesn't hesitate to include them in the various anthologies he edits, like including the most ambitious canon of the new century. Uh, also like the idea of the democratization of poetry perceived as an innate instinct as expressed in that formula, child you were born, a poet is like conceivably not far from his own understanding of what poetry is and, and should be. Um, at the other extreme of the spectrum of the literary critical reception of uh, children's writing, like uh, uh, there is the concept of songs of genius, uh, like a sort of an informal search for an inspired godlike poet who will grow to become a great master or perhaps more likely a great uh, martyr or another tragic hero like Heidze. And, uh, of, uh, on that note, Heinze himself uh, is believed to have been a, an exceptionally talented child, memorizing like long passages from literature and propaganda texts before even turning 10 and entering the prestigious Peking University at 15 to study law. Uh, it also brings to mind fairy, the fairy tale poet Wu Cheng, whose name and, and early poems written in the first decade of his life are particularly frequently invoked in various discussions on children's works today. And of course, Gu Cheng's story ended with the murder of his own wife, Xie Ye, followed by, by the poet's own suicide in exile. And it is sometimes also cited as a warning for parents and critics, uh, which is meant to prevent them from falling into that blind cult of genius and neglecting other aspects of personal and intellectual development of those, uh, the youngest generation. But of course, for unfortunately, like most parents appear to be quite, to be rather free of such unreasonable um, uh, ambitions. And uh, they rather emphasize that their children are ordinary kids whose innate imagination they as parents just try to keep as unconstrained as possible, but never try 
to push them ahead of themselves. <clears throat> they try to approach the, the problem of children's creativity in the spirit of that so-called suji jiaoyu or like education for quality, for quality that like emphasizes the overall development of a person. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's leave this uh, problem aside for now. And um, moreover, one thing that we should to, um, perhaps pay a little attention to, to is that a child genius is often a sort of retroactive phenomenon, which means that the agenda is um, like the traits of that divine talent are sought in the juvenilia of outstanding mature or late poets whose like legendary status they are supposed to like additionally reaffirm and hailing a young author uh, um, as an unprecedented talent perhaps too early it carries always a lot of risk of being mistaken and like compromising one's authority as a critic uh, so like commentators of poetry life tend to remain quite cautious in the assessment of children's uh, artistic poet potential and we will see how that hesitant way in which the critical discourse around ch children's poetry develops in one of the anthologies um, focused uh, literary critical and uh, anthologies focused of the cre of the work of Dao Tan, also a child poet who was lucky enough like to to get enough attention from uh, adult poets and critics to have a book on herself published. Anyway, I would love to spend a little more time on analyzing texts itself, but probably a more reasonable approach for this presentation is, is just talking about this as a general phenomenon and present it as panoramically as possible, show the broad scope of it rather than going into like detail that would require attention on, on textual nuances. So I would like to, to show you six phenomena. I'm afraid we may get on it to, to the fourth one or skip something. I'm way but anyway uh, the initial plan is to speak of, of six things that um, that um, the, demonstrate different ways of adult handling of, of ch child author poetry because like we can see that um, however like talented and independent minded and uh, ingenious the child is, the path in which his career and his way of writing develops by and large, the great ex to a great extent depends on adults, whether we want it or not. Uh, it is adults who, who shape he, their future. And uh, um, we will see in some cases how like spotting a talent, a genius, many people like many adult um, commentators like concentrate around it like and uh, almost like sort of, I don't know, maybe um, uh, they approach that child, they want to like be present in the part of bringing up that young genius and uh, like they are like sort of self-appointed experts who would like to contribute to the future, presumably brilliant career, career and become co-fathers and co-mothers of the expected success. And also like the way that child, child author author points circulate in cultural space is most, mostly decided by other participants of cultural discourse. That's why I would like to, to, to focus a little bit on that issue of adult handling. And the first four uh, cases will be individual cases, cases of individual authors. And this, uh, the, the last two will be focused on collective phenomena um, uh, like and on some um, activities broadest to larger groups of children and larger audiences also with some uh, social ambitions like um, a little bit more uh, socially engaged projects. Uh, Joseph says poetry classes, especially Joseph says, because there are also other poets who, who um, create various initiates uh, meant to teach children poetry writing. And then uh, the po uh, poetry of the left behind Kangu's work as, as the grassroots speaks of the project Poetry is Light, Shi Guang Shuga, which uh, is, uh, has a very self-suggestive motto, children uh, who write poetry don't smash windows. And since 2016, it has already reached around 70,000 pupils in rural and mountainous areas of China and attracted attention of media and uh, prominent sponsors. And uh, it's uh, 
basically like meant to help children from impoverished area in China to like express themselves through poetry and perhaps like seek um, better future through, through creative work. Anyway, let's begin from Chen An. Uh, Chen An is certainly is not among the earliest debuting like in terms of age and probably not among the most outstanding among child poets, but he's the one who arguably like most significantly contributed to the lowering of the unofficial age threshold for active participation in poetry life. And at the same time, he also contributed to the development of a certain stereotypical paradigm of reception from which the child author poetry still hasn't entirely freed in itself. He was born in 1992 and uh, claims to have started learning poetry and taken an interest in, write in writing at the age of five. And when he was 10, his poetry started to appear in various magazines and journals. And three years later, it was published as the book that I mentioned, The End of the World, uh, which brought him some, if modest at the time, recognition uh, among uh, literary audience, audiences to the country, in the, across the country. Uh, he became a more popular as a high school student when in 2008, after the Tangshan earthquake, he participated in a summer camp for um, earthquake, earthquake orphans and was invited to write a thematic poem for this activity. And so this was his first really, really read, like home <laughs> on the poet and poem, first very popular poem on Chinese internet. It was called An Orphan Draws Her Mom on Snow. And it basically, illustrates the general style and emotional temperature of Chen's uh, verse, as well as his like, consistently upheld artistic credo, which is that poetry should record the surrounding world. And here's the poem. Snow is a girl who descended from heaven. She carries thoughts and illusions of a mother. At the same time on earth, an orphan thinly clad looks around on snow covered ground. And with a dry twig draws her mother's face contours and imaginations emerge stroke by stroke. She takes off her clothes and puts them on her mother, takes off her shoes and curls by mother's side. Afraid of making her mother dirty, she forgets the freezing coldness of snow. And the same year, uh, Chen An was officially enthroned as a poetry prince, which uh, the, the, the nickname that I've already mentioned also. Uh, he received a prize from the hands of the chairman of Chinese Poetry Society, Lei Shuyuan, uh, who has since become a great advocate and an, sort of unofficial promoter of his poetry. And he addressed uh, Chen in the following way. This young man approaching his 18th birthday has such a great and sincere love for poetry. His little and refreshing poems contain a huge wisdom. They bring peaceful sleep to the sleepless, awakening to those who sleep peacefully, impulse for action for, to the awakened. He's a prince in the kingdom of poetry, exquisite, noble, and bright as he is. We believe poetry prince Chen Ang will open a new tomorrow in Chinese new poetry. We just need to wait and we are looking forward. Well, of course, following Lei, like several other authors and critics also like pinned their hopes on Chen as the future of Chinese poetry and express their expectations in most elevated words, like for example, Li Bai Hai, comparing him, for example, to Li Bai Hai, the Wang Guozhen, and like hailing the young prince as a spark of Chinese poetry that remained on earth, to quote one of them. Uh, and of course, exalted like topics, uh, exalted hopes and, and expectations aside, this is probably also Chen An, uh, Chen An himself who most aptly and most frankly captures the, sec the secret of his growing popularity, which is not like a sort of Lucian style revolution or bringing enlightenment to the people, but on the contrary, offering comfort and consolation to ordinary people among whom he, he also declares to count himself. He says, I'm an ordinary person so I'm capable of writing poems that will be liked by ordinary people. Real poetry is not written for others to, for others to read, but is revealed in the process of inner bodhicitta. The most direct manifestation of these conditions is that everybody who sees a so created poem feels comfortable. Well, so here's the secret. Uh, and also a quick look at which of his poems and when have attracted the greatest interest measured with the number of clicks by netizens. Uh, we can see that his statement is not groundless definitely because among 
his most clicked works are those that speak in a very innocent manner of love, of the role of the mother in one's life, or the importance of being appreciative of one of what one has, and so on. And statistics for 2016 show that his words were most intensely searched for around Mother's Day in May. And um, yeah, on the web you can also see as a, a letter written to his from by his mom to him, uh, where she sort of admonishes her son for his lack of persistence and patience and reminds him to work hard because like talent and inspiration are not enough to succeed and even to survive. And uh, several of Chen's poems were also included in school textbooks and many uh, aphorisms like I would say untidy but very genuinely like profound and revealing phrases have been used as topics for an essay at high school final examination, the so-called Gaokao. And he has been unofficially assigned and also like consciously accepted the role of a good child who might constitute an example to follow and is ready to offer others a helpful hand or word anytime. So uh, he, the Cheng An phenomenon definitely has a great educational um, value. And his biography, which in fact is like a collection of screenshots of various online articles supplemented with a selection of poems, uh, was compiled by Li Xinrong in 2016 when Chen was only 24. And this is another testimony to this particular position as a favorite that in Chong in Chinese of Chinese new poetry. Uh, as he's also sometimes uh, referred to. This illustrated with Chen's school time photos and some infantile drawings that accompany his verses. And in general, in general it paints the Im an image of a Chinese Peter Pan who refuses and perhaps is refused to grow up. And for, I've, I believe for many 20 somethings, like this would be a rather like embarrassing publication, but somehow Chen doesn't seem to mind it and instead, well, appears to have willingly embraced the role he's hoped to play. And as a loyal child of his homeland, along with that new poetry, he also writes classical style verse whose rules he learned at school and which makes him a paragon of virtue in the eyes of many, uh, like a well-educated modern young man who has not severed his connections to traditions. And of course, we may ask whether it's a calculated strategy and well, perhaps it is, I'm like not far from passing judgments here. And, um, but in any event, this specific career path certainly proved, uh, proved profitable and Chen's popularity has been turned into both material and immaterial social capital that by, by various institutions. He, for example, become the face of many campaigns uh, and the, the, the Red Cross ambassador, uh, among many other things. And he was invited as a special guest to that hugely popular nationwide classical poetry show, China Poetry Con Congress, which is broadcast by, by CCTV, where people like representing all walks of life, competing their knowledge on the po of their poetry canon. And with millions of purchased copies of his poetry collection and some ad additional sources of commercial income, she's also, Chen is also considered one of the richest authors born in the 1990s, which is of course another questionable but widely applied measure of artistic success. At the same time, while he generates like tremendous interest among media, society, and educational institutions, his poetry rather encounters little interest on the part of established literary critics and scholars. So, well, of course, it's not all, not the measure of uh, artistic quality, but still, like uh, usually, quality professional discourse and some regular feedback from various readers like constitutes a crucial element of the author's healthy growth and like his evolution as a poet, which is, I think, unlikely to occur if, if he continues to be like approvingly patted on the head as a good child of his parents and of the Chinese nation, whatever he does. And uh, well, of course, there's nothing wrong with his desire to remain part of popular culture, but 
we can we can ask whether this culture alone offers like enough space and incentives for his further development and how long he will be able to capitalize on that image of the uh, poetry prince without moving forward and where, whether that fun idol relationship between him and his audiences is the most desirable mode of poetry reception or perhaps just another like problematic model of poethood and sort of manifestation of its unhealthy cult. At any, way, at any rate, let's go to the next case, which is in many ways opposite to that of Cheng An. This is the case of Gao Zan, who's three years older than, uh, younger than, than Chen. And um, although, he, although she like evinces exceptional productivity, she has never engaged on, a, or nor has she been drawn into in any pursuit of literary stardom. Uh, at the same time, for many years, her work raised great curiosity among professional readers. And in contrast to Chen's biography, which you can say he, you see here, which consists of internet screenshots, a volume which is devoted to Gao's poetry, edited in 2009 but by Huang Hai, makes like an impression of a solid, professionally prepared work, which you can see. This is a real life picture, my, my notes uh, in the book. So this means that there is really something to read inside, unlike in the biography of, of, of Chan An. Um, just to give you an idea what kind of poetry uh, um, she writes, let me show you two probably best known poems by, by Gao Tan. The first one is written when she was around 10 years old. And uh, a guide dog, abandoned after the old man passed away, wanders alone in the streets one day on the verge of death. She saw a mirror, and in it there was a dog like she, wandering. The guide dog stepped forward, licked the mirror, and felt as if the other dog licked her too in return. The two dogs sl slightly waved their tails and lay down together to the guide dog clinging to the dog in the mirror, senses the beat of a heart, the temperature of another body, until unbeknownst to her, the mirror warms up, her heart skips for the first time for the first time someone was so close to her. The guy's dog and the mirror sleep in the corner of the city. And there is a little bit later poem, a bit more, more philosophical one, um, the, second, the second lightning. I'm afraid I somehow cannot read it from my screen. Okay. Under a deserted bridge walks a man dressed in black with a golden walking stick in his hand, a side that will one day be admired by people stuck at the clown steel wire. The speech that will one day be hated, nailed on the withdrawn hand of sunlight, humanity adrift, the dust from their shoes constantly leaving imprints on the clean earth. The man is in black, drifts toward the other end of the bridge on the opposite shore. He says, Ubermensch. People laugh, surprised, as if ridiculing a person who tries to hang an umbrella on the hook of the moon. In a slightly different vo voice, he says, Ubermensch. People's laughter suddenly freezes, dies down, they turn their back and walk away as if escaping through the gates of nightmare, fallen petals of lotter pile up on the ground like dirty slush. The man in black awaits the omen of storm, thick black clouds. He is the first lightning that cuts the black clouds. He awaits the second lightning. So as you can see, there's a little bit more to connect, uh, to comment on, on in, in these poems. And there's no wonder that adults started to treat it a little bit more seriously than, than, than Chen Ang's poetry. Uh, so, the, the, the book I mentioned, that anthology of critical texts, is compiled of 47 articles which are written by established participants of Chinese cultural discourse. And uh, at first glance, it indeed bears all traits of regular adult uh, literary critical publication. Uh, of course, unsurprisingly, there's a, a lot of moralizing and other things that usually do not take place in the adult literary discourse. Like, for example, critic Xiemian is taking a patronizing approach. And, and in one of the earliest texts published probably somehow in 2005, after an emotional eulogy to Gautan's moving poetry, her imagination and natural sensibility to the surrounding world, he then urges Gao and her parents not to engage in poetry at the cost of school education, which is crucially important for her future. In the end, he addresses Gao Tan with a familiar rhetorical questions. Do you agree with my opinion, little friend? Like, ni tong yi xiao peng yo ma? Uh, so, so that's more or less what it looks like. Also, in part of the contributions, you can observe exactly the same trend as in the feedback from uh, Chen's audiences, although perhaps wrapped in a different rhetoric. Uh, I mean, the, the 
yearning for and the desire to nail the archetypal child who speaks the language of pure poetry and in some cases perhaps also a disappointment when the commentators observe that the child starts to grow up or that grows up in a wrong way. Uh, meaning that uh, the way that is not in line with their own expectations concerning children's development or their preferred paradigm of poetry writing, as it happens, for example, in the essay by Li Xing, who po points out, uh, quote, an unavoid unavoidable decrease in quality in Gao's more mature poems, which were written since 2006, uh, and he considers them overthought and lacking in the lightness and natural harmony, which was specific of her earliest works and which he identified as Buddhist sensibility. Uh, also, to what extent poets and critics project their visions of poetry on Gao Tsang's work and all children's writing in general is perhaps best illustrated by a comparison of his essays written by Yu Dian and Wang Jiaxin, uh, who are broadly known as representatives of two opposite factions on the Chinese poetry scene, popular poetry and intellectual poetry. And Yu Dian speaks of his fascinations with the poetry garden created by Gao, which is like not available for adult authors, like including himself. He says, in fact, there is no garden around me. The garden is but a distant memory to me. And uh, it is like a sort of paradise from which he has been exiled by the rapid civilizational development, which caused gradual erosion of spiritual dim dimension of the world to which children still have access in uh, his opinion. He invokes Libai and uh, the center's long classical poetry tradition and sees Gao Tsan as a continuator of the great legacy of ancient, ancient verse written in a communion with, as he says, Mr. Nature, Ziran Xianshan. Uh, he, the eternal traditional master, the source of poets' imagination and so on. And the Gao is compared to the goddess of the primordial era and counted among the young girls who have taken care of gardens for the world and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, you who at the time, of course, in many of his liberal theoretical essays declared a general mistrust of, of modernity and like he often expresses his nostalgia for precultural world and the primordial language which is intact with random dissemination of signs without reference, uh, basically considers children poets uh, uh, as allies in his utopian mission to bring poetry back to, to its natural roots and consistently underscores elements that resonate with this conception in Gao's work. And Wang Jiaxin, on the contrary, at the very beginning cites Rilke's sophisticated utterances on poetry, like to justify his general mistrust of what is often seen as natural talent. And he emphasizes the importance of carefully processed, mature, lived experience, and also like points out the traps that await those who start writing too early. And self-awareness and cultural awareness are the key to, to artistic success, uh, success in his opinion. And to his surprise, as he claims, for all his initial skepticism about the putative genius of Gao Tan, of whom, he, of whom he had perhaps heard from his fellow poets, he managed to identify these crucial traits in Gao Tan's work. And he says, in Gao Tan's poems, I sense not only the freshness and loveliness specific of a young girl poet, but also a precocious poetic heart. I have observed author's control over the language and technique that is rarely seen at this age and the constantly growing and maturing po po poetic sensibility. And he also invokes Blake, as a pretext to trace the process of Gao's cultural qualifications and her poetry's transformations from songs of innocence to songs of experience, uh, the evolution which he, contrary to Eugene, of course, believes to be like most vital and most desirable. Uh, he's sort of intellectualist advice to Gao, which he wants to become a motto for all young, young authors. Uh, it's complemented with another quote from Rilke, uh, Rilke on the necessity of transcending one's school habits and superficial impressions. And this is the, the, the second part of the quote here. Um, well, other contributors, contributors basically draw attention to di yet different aspects of Gao Tan's work, like Huang Lihai, former member of Lower Body Poetry School, uh, he was at the time in his 30s, for example, speaks uh, very straightforwardly in his very specific like 
a characteristic personal and empathetic way uh, without any reservations, expressing his admiration for Gao Satan, who started writing poetry at the age in which he himself could, couldn't even read. And also like this fits very much his democratic conception of poetry. And he argues that poetry's essence is a vivid and sensitive soul which can inhabit a body regardless of its age and other social and biological categories. There's another um, contributor, Cao Wenxiu, and a famous fairy tale writer who focuses on the fairy tale-like elements of Dao's poetry, including like her sensibility to beauty, which often goes hand in hand with moral sensibility and openness to Sacrum as like in Plato's triad, which fits, binds together truth, goodness, and beauty. And there's also philosopher Joe Woking, which is quite important, who devotes several pages to demonstrate Gauss versus conceptual complexity. And he, he speaks about Nietzsche and her meta literary and meta linguistic awareness. And his observations to a large extent resonate with the book he wrote before, Nyo Nyo, Notes of a Father. Uh, he he it was devoted to his daughter Nyo Nyo who who died when she was 18 months old uh, like having been diagnosed with cancer in infancy and the book was very controversial due to like Joe's questionable decision not to seek medical treatment to, for the daughter's disease because he argued that even if she recovers as a blind person, she will have a hard life in the Chinese society and so on. But still, like the book contains many precious and deeply moving, and uh, even if at times like apparently idealized accounts of the child's earliest encounters with the world, uh, like that testify to, 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 to the, the daughter's innate wisdom. But well, all in all, like even if we can observe certain biases and preconceptions in the interpretations of Galtan, most of the commentators rather tend to be very tactful and I think carefully weigh their words often admits their uncertainty about to, how to approach this kind of writing. And a good example is an essay by Zhang Tsinghua, uh, whom I basically consider to be a person, a scholar, who usually know what to think and what they think of and acquires a sort of an authoritative st status. And in his essay, which closes the, vo uh, the volume, um, <clears throat> he... Um, offers a very com comprehensive and processual and intertextual analysis of Gao Tan's poetry, uh, but still densely intertwined with explicitly verbalized doubts and caveats regarding his, his own approach, which I think uh, much more than usually, I think, in Zhang's uh, essay. And he draws an extensive comparison between Gao Tan and Wu Chang and argues that Gao's work one can witness the maturing not only of the poet, but also of the Chinese poetry language at large. And uh, he interprets the a mirror and the dog, the poem that we have read. Um, and then from there, he sets out to discuss ontology and philosophy of the other writ large, uh, only to begin the next section with a reflection that his considerations are perhaps too grave. And after all, quote, this poetry was written by a child and not by a professional philosopher. And after which he again goes on to recreate the child specific traits of her poetry landscape. Um, in the end, he closes with two noteworthy postulates. The first one should not lower one's standards of critical assessment for Gautam based on her young age and shall expect from her no less than from older poets as an acknowledgement of, and perhaps the mother of respect for her talents and skills. And second, more important, we should not preach, but discuss poetry with young poets to prepare them to travel on their individual paths rather than follow closely in the footsteps of older generations. I quote this here. Well, and actually, Jiang Tsinghua's postulates are very beautifully put in practice but by Jiang Puyu and the father of the two most famous, famous siblings of the post-00 generation, Jiang Xinghe and Jiang Arman. And Mr. Jiang, who calls himself the poetry secretary of his daughters, assumed a role similar to Zhou Guoping, a greedy collector of words in Zhou's words, who is fascinated with language discoverers of Nyo Nyo and later also his second daughter, Jojo, to, to whom to both of whom he, he dedicated books. 
Uh, and uh, uh, Zhang uh, Zhou wrote a beautiful uh, sentence for a child, every new, uh, newly grasped word is alive, words that have been tainted with the touch of adults' hands, which squeezed everything out of them, passing through the little mouth of a child, genuinely resurrect and again release the pure light of life. And this is basically also the case of Zhang Puyuan. Uh, like struck by the accuracy and insi insightful, uh, uh, like he, he basically like um, very much submits to Joe, Joe's view that uh, in the process of language acquisition, what is most important is not that adults teach children how to speak, but that children help adult, adults to return to the source of language and like purify the language itself. And he was struck by the accuracy, like Jiang Puyan was struck by the accuracy and insightfulness of uh, his older elder daughter Xinhe's observations and her linguistic creations when she was one year, seven months old. And then he started writing these phrases down and gradually instilled in the girl the sense of poeticness. So like she very quickly became aware of the aesthetic value of her phrases and intuitively recognized those moments of inspiration, distinguishing them from the stream of functional everyday speech. And at five years, five months, or, or two years, five months old, also she had little sister Arman, who had like mostly observed Shinha and that uh, suddenly uh, announced that she too had inspiration and she demanded from the father to jot her poems, the poem down. And uh, as the girls were growing up uh, and learned to write Chinese characters, they launched a family poetry group on WeChat in which Singha and Arman had been posting their creations and, and, and they discussed them between themselves and with her father, who also actively comments on their words, but without interfering in their content. And well, even if he tried to, the girls wouldn't listen as, as he recalls. Uh, refuting accusations of some netizens that his poetry, uh, he, that he actually writes poetry for his daughters. Uh, he says that at most they would allow him to correct his written characters. Um, so they are pretty much uh, independent. On the internet, one can also, of course, come across his, his own poems posted along with those on Shinka and Arman as a sort of a poetic conversation within the family, usually recalling some moments spent together and a nice family time. Uh, and since the beginnings, like the respective beginnings of their poetry adventures, each girl has already written several hundreds of poems. They published two co-author poetry collections, A Lamp on Snow and uh, A Lamp Burned a Hole in Dark Night. Uh, the titles are borrowed from their representative works uh, and in 2020, Arman um, had also her solo debut with the book Jiang Arman's Poetry, which contains 140 short poems. And they were awarded a number of local and national level poetry prizes and their works were printed in like numerous leading literary journals and uh, poetry anthologies, including Best of Chinese Poetry or Yearbooks of Chinese Avant-Garde Poetry and so on. And they often, very often write together and act together uh, they are so endowed with mutually opposite temperament, like Shinka is very subtle and tactful and uh, Arman is very lively and straightforward and they constitute a very perfectly balanced pair, which from time to time appears in TV shows or and on their own poetry video channels. Uh, channel, which is part of the WeChat profile they established when they were nine and 13 years old, called AA Tang, meaning AA Candy, where they animate poetry activity of the famous, uh, of the, of the post zero zero authors, and also in short videos where they discuss poems that drew their attention written by famous and not so famous authors, like from contemporary times and classical poetry as well. Um, just to, 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 to have a look on what they write by themselves, here are some short poems. Jiang Arman, the younger write, one, writes, for example, Light, a lamp burns a hole in dark night, or Ancient Poetry, I put a newly written poem in the sun to expose it to light for it to turn yellow, which like an ancient verse that has been circulating for thousands of years, and so on. Jiang Xinhe, the, the older one, writes, Dad, do you know that little butterflies are easy to catch and big butterflies are difficult to catch because big butterflies have experienced too much in their lives? This is actually probably her earliest poem when she was less than two years old. 
And the second one is uh, one that I pretty much like because it's a little bit deconstructionist when you read it in the context of like this, for example, the logocentrism and the construction. Uh, I remember when I was two, I chose a name for myself. I, it was Wang Yuxi or perhaps Wang Yuxi or perhaps Wang Yuxi or perhaps Wang Yuxi written in different characters or something yet different. Now it's already undecidable because at the time I didn't know how to write. So there is that tension between sound and uh, character and so on, but there's no, no, no really time to, to discuss it now. Anyway, uh, just like exactly just like Chen Ang's and um, Okay, at Chang An's and Gao Tan's poetry careers, the case of the Jiang sister, of course, provokes many specific questions, like the most perplexing of them for me is the one that concerns poetry's authorship and what I tentatively call poetic ensoulment, which is the moment from which one can be considered a poet. And when we recall the earliest uh, tiny poems jotted by, by Jiang Puyu, and we cannot not ask who is their author, like the girl who first accidentally asked if like smashing a mosquito with a random movement of her hand produced an astonishingly astute uh, sentence, or perhaps the sensitive father who like immediately recognized its aesthetic potential and give a, a, gave it a poetic form, even dividing it into la lines. And perhaps most crucially, he called it poetry, which means that he drew it into a discursive space, which is infused with complex forces whose like vectors are de co-determined by, by the phenomena such as intertextuality, cultural affinities, hierarchies, and many other factors. And, and thus like the modest lines picked up by that loving that acquire a new contextual sense. Um, but yeah, we can think of many authors who actually identify themselves and are identified as poets and who draw inspir inspiration from or even directly invoke phrases that were overheard from various people who are not aware of their poetic potential or the, of their speech and they simply frame their as poetry without adding too much from themselves. And usually like no one tries to question the poetryness of such an overheard poem or, or its, uh, its authorship as if like one's generally recognized poethood itself were that source of the poetic quality and the hands of someone who is a poet as recognized as a poet were like miraculously turning everything they touch into poetry like that mythological Midas turned everything into gold. Uh, but unlike parents who sort of hijack their children's language language discoveries from for themselves to like fuel their own verse production Jiang Puyuan is very fair and he decided to withdraw and like from the beginning leave the entire copyright let's say to his daughters and he supported their literary development from behind the scenes and crucially he also instilled in them the awareness of this the yeah the awareness of this copyright uh, in fact and both privileges and responsibility that call with it, that come with it and in fact it might be said that Arman who also surprised her that with a, that bold declaration that she too had experienced an inspiration moment where from the very first line was a full blown author who was conscious of her artistic agency and subjectivity to a certain extent, not only poetically and soul, but also sort of and minded. And this, of course, certainly helped her assume the, the role of the tacit leader of her generation very early on before even turning 10 years old. And um, for example, in a TV show, Don't Leave After School, Fang Xue Buzhou, which is hosted by the superstar of CCTV, Sabe Ning, she said with, uh, with self-confidence, writing poetry doesn't mean you have to take a pen and paper and physically write. And she said that it's a matter of imagination and the ability to express one's own perception of various phenomena a perception that she holds with, uh, in children is much more complicated than adults assume when they ask kids to read naive poems about Granny Moon or Sister Wind and Blinking Stars from school textbooks. Uh, it seems that the young sister like, are free from the Peter Pan syndrome, which uh, was manifests itself, itself in Cheng An's case. Uh, in one of the interviews, Arman says that if she doesn't grow up, she will become a giant infant, which she definitely doesn't want. 
And on the other hand, they also like do not struggle to get ahead of themselves and they are not pushed to do so by their parents. And although in many ways they can perceive as more mature and perhaps intellectually more independent than their coevals, they like certainly do not try to rush it and by all means adopt an adult point of view and, and writing style. Uh, as Savening actually noted addressing Armand's work and saying that in her poems, you will not find an attempt to, to pretend the tone of the adult. They perfectly reflect the, her age. And of course, although the girls sometimes speak of inspiration, they are also not very much affected by the romantic myth of inspired, lofty poethood, which is embodied by ingenious individuals and they treat writing as a passion rather than mission. And Armand says that, that she doesn't want to be a professional poet, but rather a business woman who, a woman who keeps creating poetry at her leisure. And she also adds that her elder sister has already started her business, although like no one knows what kind Kind of business it is. Um, of course, the popularity of the young sister and their sort of idyll idyllic accounts of their family life in poetry and, and interviews have raised curiosity among the audiences about like, the key to success, which as the readers uh, and netizens accurately assumed must lie in their mother's and father's wife's approach to parenting. And indeed, like the, the parents provided the daughters with excellent environment to learn about the world and as well as to develop sensibility, imagination and everything else in, in the spirit of this, the famous Suj Jayu. And netizens wanted to know all the details. But on the, on the uh, other hand, when they disclosed that the elder sister, uh, Shin He, didn't even go to school because she found herself somehow uh, unprepared to it, uh, perhaps she she considered she she was bored at school. She 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 received home education, with, which um, of course rose controversy, rose controversies among among uh, internet commentators, all of whom knew better how to raise their child and so on. Anyway, um, uh, this is also like everybody knew this wanted to know the key to the success, but it's not the case that every that every parent wants their child to be a poet. Uh, and um, basically they just uh, do that poetry education, encourage creativity and imagination, imagination just to broaden the scope of the child's uh, interest, knowledge, and not necessarily to, to that they wish them a, for them a career in poetry. Uh, and one example of such an exceptional mother, <laughs> a very nice one, is um, uh, is the mother of Tieto, the next poet whom I would like to discuss here. Uh, Tieto is that poet scandalist who I have already cited and quoted a little bit. And he's known also for his exceptionally early book debut and uh, sort of more a scandal his works provoked on the internet. And his stories, in many ways similar to that of the young sister, because he was born in a well-educated family, both his parents are journalists and his mother, Liguetia, herself writes and publishes poetry, and it is, of course, to her that Tieto owes his passion for writing. And um, well, there are certain discrepancies in how Tieto and his mom remember the beginnings of his career. And Ligua Idea recalls that when she observes her son's linguistic creativity, she first like started to jot his poetic sentences in a very non-comital way. And later she actively encouraged him to produce poetry, hoping that in the future it would constitute for him like a gateway from, from tedious everyday life and its burdens. And although she, uh, he's, she says he's just an average student who struggles with many classes, uh, unlike most parents who like, drive their kids like crazy from one private teacher to another. Well, actually this practice has recently been significantly limited by the government, as we all know, probably. And uh, still, Lee didn't want uh, Tieto to take any extracurricular lessons and instead allowed him to spend more time at home on reading and writing. And his literary achievements, uh, she believed, you know, gave him the awareness of his own value and self-confidence in his relationships with friends. 
And so at six years old, Tieto wrote his first poem, The Colors of Dream, which Li Guizhi posted on a microblog account, which she launched for him. And three, year, three years later, Tsinghua University Press published his poetry collection, Will Always a uh, Little Bastard, Liu Shu Shige Chou Xiaozi. And Tieto, on the other hand, uh, contrary to his mother, claims that during the first three years as a poet, his mom pushed or forced him to write, and, um, and it is only at the age of nine that he realized that he really liked poetry. He says that before I was very unenthusiastic about poetry writing. Mom always pushed me to write because she thought I had talent and she wanted me to write more. But at the time I didn't understand mom's intention and didn't listen to her. Still, I kept writing due to her persistence. And so pushed by mom until I was nine, I suddenly came to like writing poetry. Some of my poems were published and I was interviewed by Liga Daily. I was very happy to see my works in print. Now poetry has become a part of me. I love writing. Well, at any rate, the pushing certainly wasn't very violent and devoid of love, and uh, Tieto also knew how to intelligently defend himself. And when his mom once asked him whether he felt she was creating pressure on him, he, he reportedly replied, I write when I want to write. When you push me, I will just counter-attack you with a poem. But and so, well, we should know that when Tieto counterattacks, he indeed doesn't really mean his words and causing a lot of consternation among his adult audiences. Among his works, we will find, for example, a poem in which he compares himself, he, his mom, to a little earthhole cat, quote, because she complies with all criteria to be a little earthhole cat. Or, for example, there's a poem titled Love, I think, where he declares that, quote, there is no love between me and grandma. She's really too old. She's not, there is no love between me and mom. I only like her breasts. Well, which makes me think of another poem from Lower Body Poetry School, namely like Shan Hao boss a handful of good teeth. Uh, but yeah, that's a topic for another thing, uh, for another uh, speech. Uh, the talk. Um, well, his mother apparently doesn't take to heart what one could perceive as an early stage male chauvinism of, of her son, and she claims that we should allow children to freely express their minds in their own unique way. On In October 2015, she posted uh, on Weibo uh, Tieto's new poem, sorry, titled Desire Yuang, uh, which provoked a discussion about the boundaries between avant-garde and eroticism, and of course about the principles of ethical child rearing. This is the poem. Everybody has desires biting a bone. I feel a desire that makes me friends like a dog when I kiss with mom. Desire turns into an infant that says it will never grow up. When a plane flies through darkness, desire is a worm, tries to avoid being stepped on or smashed, desperately pushes forward, desire is everywhere. Mm. Well, whereas like poets were generally very enthusiastic about this and the other two poems that I quoted previously, and uh, Joe Sessa even included love in his anthology of the best poetry of 2014, of course, netizens expressed their doubts about the text's literary value and also the ethical message, and even some saw the action of evil forces in this poem, uh, as well as some doubt about the author's mental health. Also, some criticism fell onto the head of his mother, who was accused of consciously provoking the steer uh, uh, around Tieto. And she first commented on these charges in her article in Global Times, Huan Shibao, in 2014. And she assured that everything that Tieto wrote is, of course, his own invention and the effect of his individual perception of the world. And one year later, in the first financial daily, she of course, uh, repeated that statement and added that poetry simply, quote, goes beyond most adult expectations with regard to children. Uh, and that children are not made to ingratiate themselves with adults. Adults too should respect children, their individuality and their observations. And basically she claimed that children actively process various impulses that come to them from the external world and which are much richer and more diverse than when their parents' generation was growing up. And she says, when I heard it, it I felt as if I, I instantly shrank because when I was nine, 10 years old, I would have never pronounced such a word and desire. 
today many media develop in a different way and one should never underestimate children's receptibility to information. Um, well, among Seattle's advocates, there was, for, for example, a renowned critic, Qin Xiaoyu, who made a case very similar to Zhou Guoping in uh, Niu Niu, uh, claiming, that, claiming that children are teachers for adults who have already lost their pure hearts, and what adults see as eroticism and pornography in the hands of the child is just pure and innocent, as in the Confucius assessment of the Shijing, the classics of poetry, the 300 poems from the Shijing can be summarized in one sentence. There is no evil in thought, the famous Su uh, in Chinese. And also, Qin invokes Du Fu, another uh, classical great master. I won't put aside the pen until I disquiet people with my words. This is an, uh, in Chinese, Yu Bu Qing Ren Su Bu Xiao. Uh, well, uh, admittedly, it would be difficult to find more respected authorities in Chinese culture than Confucius and the two who to polemicize with Qin. Uh, though one may, of course, have some reservations about both pedagogical and, and perhaps epistemological value of making such far-reaching connections between a nine-year-old boy and ancient sages. Well, a problem to which we should definitely pay more attention. I do it in the paper, unfortunately, here again, no time and space for that. Uh, also, Tieto's Petr would probably be a fascinating case for Freud and his followers in psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis who very likely would not share netizens' concerns about mental health of, of Tieto. And it was actually as assessed by one of psychologists from Shanghai who, who says that there's nothing to worry about because images such as breasts or love are very positive manifestations of a child's early maturity and they shouldn't be interpreted in the sexual context. But as a, a sort of young author's observation, how his mother expresses his love for him through her body. Well, uh, anyway, it would be certainly interesting to observe how Tieto's carnal sensibility and his astonishingly concrete imagination will keep developing in the future through, through poetry and perhaps otherwise. Uh, he certainly has an eye for sort of fleshy detail, which might be a trait he inherited from his parents who are journalists. Uh, and he once declared that he was going to follow in their footsteps and become a journalist too. But what, he, what attracts him to this job is especially the prospect of uh, interviewing various interesting people. And I'm afraid that for this, he will certainly need to learn a more diplomatic language. Uh, okay, so that's uh, all about uh, Tieto. And now there comes, there's time or no time for, uh, I'm not sure whether I can still continue <laughs> speaking, but there are the two, uh, let's say, collective phenomena, um, po poetry's role in education and, um, and poetry addressed to children for, uh, for, for impoverished areas, for mountainous uh, provinces. Um, let me check the time. Mm. Can I spend some 10 or 15 minutes? Yes, yes, yeah, please just continue, it's fine. Okay, <laughs> you can say stop anytime. <laughs> so, of course, like, mm, not, oops, something happened, sorry. Uh, not, not all children were lucky enough to be born in poetic families, and some were very unlucky to be born in clearly unpoetic ones, as those we will uh, like encounter in the last section. But all uh, claim the proponents of the massification of poetry education have us that poetic soul which waits for its Socratic midwife who will help it make its way to, to the external world by somehow jumping out or through the child's mouth or floor, flowing down the hand or on paper. And among the most active champions of this idea in China is the avant-garde poet Zhou Sese, who is known among other things as the author of the concept of Kachou Jui, uh, which translates literally as culturism from the phonetic translation of the English culture. And he's also like the prime of the Kachou poetry faction and the journal they, they produce and so on. And since 2013, Joe has regularly published uh, children's poems in the yearbooks of poetry he edits, and he has also been participating in numerous events promoting their works, 
uh, writing reviews and introductions for the individual collections, giving lectures on poetry to kids and lectures on how to bring up a poet to their parents and organizing poetry workshops, especially in Beijing and Shenzhen. And as teaching materials, he very often uses works written by the young audiences, audiences Kolivas, like including the Young Sisters or Tieto or Participants of Poetry's Light Project, to which we'll come soon. Uh, and uh, Joel's social fascination with children's poetic output is very much in line with his general views on poetics, which somehow gradually crystallized in the various manifestations of cultural jury. And here are some definitions that basically show to what extent this resonates and what are the not so disinterested reasons in which uh, he does all that stuff for the kids. Um, basically, this is the, I will just uh, skip most of that, but uh, just have a quick look. Kachoji emphasizes a psychological return to real life and discovers new possibilities of life. Kachoji is a real writing tackling physiological phenomena in human society. A representative of Kachoji plays in the middle of seriousness and warns to play. It is not mysticism and it's not realism. A middle class Kachoist doesn't treat Kachoji as a postmodern mode of concept but as a postmodern way of thinking, perhaps even a way of solving problems. The psychology of exposure and liberation present in Joseph's works has already helped many readers free themselves of predicament. Solving problems for literature is an idea of Kachoji. Kachoji is also a mature blog, one of the characteristics of new, new literature, and then he keeps comparing it to the psychology and physiology of children, you know, children who are basically curious about everything, who absorb the world unconditionally, almost physiologically, as if like through their skin and they are fully exposed to its impact without any protective layers and on the other hand they are capable of pitilessly exposing its absurdities like in that uh, famous tale of emperor's new clothes and they enjoy the greatest freedom of mind and imagination and they are paragons of kachonas and uh, if Jun, another member of the group uh, puts it very clearly that a kachonist believes that kachon should preserve its virginity and always resemble a child. It should strive to become very innocent, strive for forgiveness from the external world. Kachio should be excited about the return, return to childhood. Kachio itself has colors of fairy tales and purity and so on. So we, we see that Blake's song of innocence here again. Well, so in sum, uh, we may say that on the one hand, uh, Kacho is should learn from children, but on the other hand, those children whose childhood has been less Kacho, let's say, because their natural Kacho became suppressed, for example, by, by family situation or by some daunting school reality and unreasonable expectations pinned on them can be fixed through poetry education and which has the power to unblock their potential. And this is the aim of Joseph's activities, which are addressed to children and their parents who feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the public education system in which like if poetry appears at all, there's only space for classical verse with its uh, formal rules and no space for, for free creation. And in addition to various poetry events, in order to help the little readers make up for what schools neglect, he compiled a five volume anthology, read a good poem before saying good night to your child, for which he selected poems from Chinese and foreign authors that he believes are accessible to children, but on the other hand, not so, un, not, do not like underestimate their intelligence and sensibility. And he, he says in the introduction to the volumes that the real poetry is child itself, or its thoughts, words, facial expressions, movements are poems, and the role of the parents and educational institutions is to guide the child to write down all of this before it becomes irretrievably lost. Those who prevent children from writing poetry are losers in their life and totally unpoetic people. Uh, and one of, um, also like the, that, um, something that, um, important thing that's happened like that shows that this is not just like uh, empty postulates of Joe Sesse um, and that his in excitement with the logic of poetry, the curiosity about new things, the yearning for the unknown world abused by children is the fact that he himself actually very much redefined his poetics uh, based on the impact that children's works made, uh, made on, on him and he developed a new concept of poetry as fieldwork research, 
at Kenya Diaotas in academic work, but without that formidable theoretical methodological apparatus. And this is that uh, mode of writing which allows him to embrace phenomena which are mutually as distant as on the one hand, like ancient temples, which he contemplates during his research expeditions. And on the other hand, like more artificial intelligence technologies, which he also very much uh, uh, advocates for. Mm, well. Uh, but one of the most intriguing initiatives addressed to children that Joseph contributed to, like took place in October 2020 at the primary school affiliated to Beijing Dai Middle School Branch School, um, which invited him for a writing poetry on the spot event for puppies. And uh, that, that workshop, which in the photographs here uh, looks perhaps a little more like an outdoor PE class, like sport class, more than a poetry class, and was part of the official launch of the Little Valley Poetry Club, Shaoshang uh, Wu which is an initiative addressed to the youngest students and a foretaste of the intense poetry training at the next stage of education at Beijing Dayu Middle School, uh, which is an experimental institution, one of, I think, 10 in China right now, uh, which has been uh, granted the name of Poetry School by Beijing Writers Association, of course, in the presence of high-ranked party officials and in appreciation of its excellent long-time efforts to promote that important element of Chinese cultural heritage. And basically, like the poetry education in the middle school uh, is uh, realized in three, three ways. It uh, has regular poetry classes in the curriculum and greater focus on analyzing poetry uh, during regular Chinese lessons, then activities such as guest lectures and poetry readings of established poets, trips to the countryside in search of inspiration and so on. And then the second, the third kind of organizing poetry events, performances and competitions on occasion on various traditional and national festivals like Spring Festival or China's National Day or Mao Zedong's birthday and other anniversaries. And gradually like, they are also integrating poetry related content uh, into other classes in the students' curriculum and uh, poems by Chinese, famous Chinese and foreign authors that hang along the walls of school corridors and as a form of motivation and appreciation every year they publish an anthology of students' poems and sometimes also some individual collections. Well, of course, needless to say, the idea of poetry schools cannot like, not cause some mixed feelings among poetry readers and practitioners, because like, on the one hand, it may sound like a paradise on earth when one like, reads poetry following the unique prose of the absorbing what's best in the world through, through, uh, through verse. And on the other hand, of course, there's a question, what else one breathes in when like, happily in in inhaling that poetry oxygen from the air, which anything but clean and like various other substances may, may be sprayed in it by which, by which I mean ideological content and especially of course in totalitarian countries poetry education can easily be manipulated in such a way that it turns into a gradual ideological intoxication and it is not difficult to guess what kind of verse is, is performed for example for instance on like Mao Zedong's birthday or the anniversary or the proclamation of the PRC but even if we put this kind of suspicions aside, there still also exists another risk of sort of metaphorically put hyperventilation in those who breathe too much of poetry and too greedy and perhaps they might made us lose touch with reality. And yet another risk as sort of another metaphor oxidative stress, so to say, in which people whose minds may feel somehow overwhelmed by that omnipresence of poetry and its intrusion in like every cell of their body in a way that they do not manage to, to process. Whereas everything like poetry education can be overdone or misdone and it's expected like miraculous effect on, on young organisms may turn into its opposite, especially in the case of sort of systemic initiatives that are addressed to large groups of children with, without um, individual approach and monitoring every individual child and uh, adjusting content to their specific abilities, needs and interests. But this is 
just one pole of the Chinese reality. And Dayumi Middle School is a prestigious institution for little emperors and empresses from the capital city who are just locked in tight by generally safe cage of parental protection and strict rules of that educational system. And like what you're writing is perhaps like opening the cage door a crack like to, to, to let air of freedom in. On the other part of the Chinese reality, there are millions of children who live their existence in the margins of the system and well, often beyond the sight and even interest of their parents or perhaps without parents at all and for whom like their unlimited freedom is just another synonym of solitude and abandonment. And they lived in all those impoverished villages like most in central and western provinces, which like economically lag far behind the, the developing southern, southeastern regions. Um, and um, well, their parents like attracted by sort of value promise or of decent salaries uh, being in the, or people in the reproductive age migrate to rich metropolises to work in of course humiliating conditions and leaving their children behind with grandparents or in some makeshift village dormitories attached to underfunded and under equipped schools which like frequently even lack qualified staff. And the task of bridging that educational gap and reducing inequalities between rural, rural and industrial areas rests largely on the shoulders of the thousands of so-called zhijiao, literally translated as support education, and volunteer teachers who are trying at good universities and decide to move usually for a year or two to the countryside in order to support local schools. And many of them are first graduates who just take a gap year between their bachelor's and master's studies and and like with their heads filled with ideas and enthusiasm, they wish to make a noble use of their newly obtained knowledge. Uh, and this was exactly the case of Kang Yu, who was the founder of the project Poetry Slide, dedicated to children in rural and mountainous areas on China, in China in 2015, after receiving her BA in Chinese from Renmin University in, in Beijing. She decided to join the ranks of the volunteers in order to, as she says, help more children escape the mountains. But soon she realized that these kids were not really waiting for her, like her eyes wide open and hungry for knowledge. And instead, she had to deal with little troublemakers who didn't like teachers and were generally not used to and clearly not fond of the company of adults. And boys would jump over the wall to escape classes and, and uh, one very young girl actually became pregnant and, and got married before even complete, completing the first stage of education. So uh, Kang says that, uh, she recalls that, I pinned my hopes on the students in front rows because only they had a chance to be admitted by a middle school and change their fate. Uh, but something prompted her to change her mind and it was a conversation with the headmaster who made they aware that the future of the village and the, and the county will not be shaped by those who, who live and pursue a better life in the city, but by those who stay. And therefore, it's actually they who should be paid greater attention to. And that's how it all began. And from this one conversation and one eureka moment on a rainy day, uh, when students, instead of listening to the teacher, kept staring through the windows and can you knowing that there's like no point to, to, to shovel conventional knowledge in their heads when something else attracts their attention. She uh, took the children out of the classroom to hear and feel the rain and she proposed them to write a poem about this experience. And the idea and uh, surprisingly caught on and like the feedback feedback astounded uh, Kan Yu because she, children to whose mind she felt she had literally no access suddenly opened up to her like for initially not perhaps without some shyness, but she managed to, to break it by encouraging them to, them to adopt some pen names. Uh, still, not all of them needed anonymous mess, and Kang also remembers how a very quiet girl in the last row called, called her and she handed this poem to her, which perhaps was inspired by Bu Cheng's I'm a Willful Child, was she in the Heise, which couldn't like not move any committed teacher to, to tears. And the poem reads, I am a selfish child, I wish the sun after rain only shone on me, warmed me. I'm a selfish child. I wish a corner of this world emptied when I'm sad to comfort me. I'm a selfish child. I wish mom's love belonged to me. Uh, 
Well, and this is how, of course, poetry writing became integral part of Kangi's classes and for the rest of her two years stay in the village and it tightened her bonds with the children. And it followed her back to Beijing. And here's the story. Uh, how the Poetry is Light Foundation began. And when she was already in Beijing, one of the girls sent her a letter in which she says how much poetry writing actually helped her in life, how, how she gained some self-confidence through it. Uh, she learned to be more assertive. And uh, she also sent a little poem, people in heaven are light a fire, people on earth are making goals and expressed a wish that more children will find their self in poetry as she did. So <clears throat> for Kanye, it was no, nothing more had to be said. And that's what she recalls from that teacher's day to the establishment of Poetry is Light passed less than one month. I didn't hesitate a lot. I decided to commit myself to this undertaking, not, not because there was a big chance of success, but because I discovered a need and an answer. So I couldn't pretend that I hadn't seen it. Well, fair enough. Uh, today, uh, as of I think it was March 2020 when the data was, data was updated, according to the statistics published on the official website of the project, uh, it's already 68,000 of students, over 800 schools and 900 local teachers in, in several provinces, including Yunnan, Guangzhou, Guangxi, have become beneficiaries of this initiative that grew out from this one spark of light uh, and the foundation launched by Kanyu in 2017. It, they, every day they accept dozens of new applications from both like uh, village schools who ask for support and from volunteers who would like to offer their energy and experience to work with children and with their teachers and instruct uh, the teachers how to take up the task they, they initiated and provide them with well-designed materials to use during regular Chinese lessons and during extracurricular poetry classes and uh, Poetry is Light also organizes other events uh, including concerts, contests and some poetry seminars to which they invite well-known Chinese poets. Uh, a fre frequent guest on these seminars is Duo Yu, uh, um, Yunnan Bo and Tianjin based poet and scholar who also was once associated with the lower body poetry movement. And in 2019, he was joined by the famous poetry couple Wang Xiaomi and Xu Jingya. And usually the sim seminars are very simple. They just consist of poet talk and Q&A session and some poetry writing mini workshop uh, during which the students just have an opportunity to write on their own and get some professional feedback from, from the guests. And some accounts of these events and poems by children are available on the website. And uh, um, I would just want to, to show you to uh, the poetry collection that emerged from that project and was released in May 2022 by Jiangsu Feng Huang Wenyi Chuanxia, also edited by Guo Mai, like the first anthology we saw uh, in this presentation. And it contains scans of the poems ha handwritten by children, and some of them are accompanied by brief comments. Um, uh, by, by the authors which explain the circumstances in which the poems were created. And it's also beautifully illustrated by 30 or 31 artists selected out of more than 400 volunteers who responded to the call published online by uh, Poetry Slide. And these include Chinese and foreign and professional and amateur authors. So this is really a, a great job. And the the foundation Poetry is Light is supported by prominent uh, commercial partners such as Starbucks and Xiaomi and by media, including Beijing Weishi, Jiangsu Weishi and so on. And in December and January 2019-2021, of the Starbucks cafes in Guangzhou hosted a free exhibition of child offered poetry and, and illustrations from this book. And well, who knows, like perhaps like given that Guangzhou has one of the most numerous populations of rural migrant, migrant workers, and perhaps among the visitors, there were also parents of some of the child authors, and perhaps they too write poetry. Because like from the literary sociological point of view, the poetry of little poets in big mountains, to allude to the title of the anthology, is a phenomenon that is 
complementary, we may say, to the so-called Dagong Shilge, which is poetry of migrant workers and which has been already widely researched uh, in the recent years in Chinese and foreign academia. And there was a lecture, I remember, uh, by Mahio, a very great one, also in the um, trans the Transition Project, so probably most of you are quite familiar with that. And on the content level, it shows the same problem of detachment from one's native place, but showed from the other side, from the perspective of children who remained alone in their villages. And well, one could sometimes even kind of pair these poems uh, of children and of adults and ar arrange them in like sort of a very deeply touching poetic correspondence between migrant worker parents and their left alone uh, children and they also raise similar questions including the most frequently asked one is it even poetry or perhaps just a therapy or a community strengthening social practice well can you herself uh, consistently emphasizes that her mission uh, is not to turn all children into poets but rather to shape their sensibility and offer them tools to cope with their emotions and experiences in a way that will be not self-destructive. And she says in the introduction that poetry classes are not intended to produce poets, but to tell the children you need to have the passion for exploring, retain emotional sensibility, develop the ability to feel the happiness, to write out the pain. Even anger can be alleviated through a poem. And somewhere else she adds, I hope these children, even if they never leave the big mountains, will discover the light that is in, her, in their hands. Um, well, at the same time, although like certainly not all, all of these points like, will immediately strike us as, as masterpieces and like in terms of the writing technique and richness of vocabulary, they often do not, don't, do not, do not match. And not only professional adult author verses, but also those written by the better educated co-evals from big cities. But there are also true pairs that testify to the author's unique feel for language, imagination, sensibility, and that do have what we can perceive as a true poetry, poetry, poetry uh, artistic value uh, as well. Um, we can uh, just to, to, to end, so to wrap it up, see two little ones from the anthology. Uh, representing two most uh, eagerly raised topics, uh, nature and um, some family related uh, issues. The first one is Star River by Juan Kun, 10 years old. She, she writes, black night stars twinkling. I'm walking carefully along the river bank. When I turn my head to look at the water, all I see are countless stars floating on the river. Well, perhaps it doesn't look like a poem that, poem that would be difficult to write, but I think it exactly like has the very right, strikes the right balance between rhetorics, imagery, and she knows where to end, like not uh, producing too, too much, like overthinking, and she gives us with a sort of suspense, surprise, the, uh, a material to think of. And the second one is a little tree and a big bird. I am a little tree, mom is a big bird. The, bird, the big bird has flown far away. The little tree is growing day by day. When the big bird returns, the little tree will offer a home for her. Again, nothing very sophisticated, but when we read it closely, we see that the entire logic of family and social relationships inverted, and it's done in such a subtle way that we have to, like, add those emotions from ourselves. She isn't like lamenting their fate. She just says as if like nothing unnatural happened, that this is she, the small bird, uh, that, that little tree who will like receive and welcome her mother when she finally returns from her voyages, whatever she's doing, or maybe will not return at all. So yeah, um, <laughs> there is, of course, as I said, there are of course many research questions and many philosophical concerns to, to think about. And so this is what I'm trying to do in a paper uh, based on which uh, I uh, base this presentation. Um, but this, of course, requires a little bit more of close reading to, to proceed to those topics. But basically, I propose a way of thinking of child written child author poetry, starting from the notion of placebo. 
uh, asking whether this poetry really is poetry or this is just a poetry placebo and starting from that observation that what what helps and what cures in poetry is the very genre itself, unlike in the diary or a novel when one is healed in the process of just simply writing one's thoughts out and like giving a linguistic form for it. In poetry, the very fact that someone is writing poetry, so one is like reaching that sort of different space, a more elevated area of life. Let's say someone that's, that they were taught at school that is somehow different, perhaps better, that may, that recontextualizing this experience as poetry itself has um, maybe alleviated in that inner pain on, of which can you is speaking. And of course, then the question remains whether <laughs> placebo poetry is still poetry and there is no way to answer this. If it's healing, then okay, but then, well, if this placebo is also like actively consumed by those who actually do have real self-awareness about what poetry usually is and is like, like those uh, well-known poets like Isha, Wang Xiaoni or Wang Jiaxin and so on, it starts still, even if it's placebo, it starts circulating in that um, poetic discursive blood circulation system by means of various intertextual phenomena, association, interpretation, and so on. So that becomes part of that poetry field. And uh, we cannot say it's, it is poetry, but we cannot also say that it's not poetry. And actually arguing that it is, it's not poetry requires a very huge effort. And each argument is almost like immediately counter by counter argument that would just very easy you can find examples in the history of poetry that will speak that okay similar from phenomena happened this can be connected to this this can be connected to that so there are counter arguments that speak for its poetryness in in fact so i compare it to the notion of asymptotic freedom in science which of course we would need a lecture in physics to to come to it but it's basically a phenomenon in some kinds of atoms or particles that in which um electrons or microparticles that are closer to each other actually uh, evince much weaker interactions than those that are far away from each other and from the center. So the further from the center, the stronger is that interaction. So the, the more strongly it's put toward the center. This is more or less what I think happens in that poetry. And those margins, that external layer of the poetry thing, I think actually of the poetry field, I think actually plays also a very crucial role in the definition of poetry as such. It is like and it makes it uh, distinct and visible. We can feel, uh, feel, think, for example, like uh, of compare it to a cloud, which like itself, it's a gas and vapor, but it still has a very discernible lining, and it's, which makes us to perceive it's not like a, as a puff of mist, which like gradually melts into thin air. So like in other words, if it weren't for the problematic liminal phenomena, just a child of her poetry and uh, poetry as such wouldn't be so closely and so thoroughly thematized and problematized in any broader cultural, cultural discourse. And its distinctiveness as a genre would perhaps not be constantly reasserted even if uh, never actually defined in the strictest sense of the word definition. Okay, but that's for the further thinking. Uh, that's probably the point at which I should end. Thank you very much for your attention and patience and uh, thank you in advance for any comments and uh, questions. <laughs>